God. God dedicates himself to bring down the proud. Do you want God to bring you down, mm. brother? Pride comes before the fall. Yeah, but he also says he, tear, he destroys the house of the proud. Mm. See, you treasure your family above anything else, don't you? Yeah. Okay, so you want to protect that family, right? Right. So you want to stay humble. And that's why it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you. Let him exalt you. You don't need to exalt yourself. Stephen, from Solomon's point of view, what is, what is the value of vision and hope? You talk about vision mapping. Yes. How, do, how do we get vision and hope for our top priority? Okay. He said, without a vision, the people perish. Hmm. So we can take the converse of that. With vision comes new life. Now, when you go into a marriage relationship, for example, the husband has a vision. We'll say that's here. The wife has a vision. They think their vision is going to be achieved in their marriage because in courtship, they get closer and closer. They get married, honeymoon's over, and boom, they're back out here. They don't know what happened. They've lost their vision, okay? Or they never had a vision in the first place. So what we teach in, in that uh, is how to bring vision Every project I did, I did over a thousand projects when I was in television. And every one, it would start with end result, where I want to be. Just picture a Google map, where you're going, right? Yeah. Where you are right now. Now, how do I map that out that I get from here to there? Well, I break it down first into general goals. Okay, if I'm going to accomplish this, here's my goals. I have to do that. Now, each goal, I need to break into specific tangible mm. steps of action. And then if a step of action requires more than two things, if it's complex rather than simple, then I need specific tasks. So I would go ahead and I would break it down, break the vision into goals, into steps, into tasks, and then you put dates on them. And that way I was able to accomplish with a, basically I had a marketing department of, of three of us, four of us, and we would accomplish more in a year than our biggest competitor who had a marketing department of 150 people. That's the power of a vision map. Well, when you vision map, and you don't vision map everything. Like I, I, I took up skiing at 41 because I wanted to ski with my wife and she was a great skier and I was worthless. And uh, I, my vision wasn't becoming a good skier. My vision was being able to go up on the chairlift with her, go down the run she wants to go on and not kill myself. Okay. Good vision. Yeah, real simple. And so I did that. I never, but I never wanted to compete. My son, on the other hand, was a high jumper, and uh, he wanted to be, as any little kid, he wanted to be the national champion. So uh, we got him a good coach, and um, uh, she laid out a vision map where he had to be each step of the way. His food. His, she was a three-time Olympian but his, what his diet would consist of, the number of workouts he would do each week, the number of training workouts he would do each week, what he needed to accomplish. And she said, if you do everything I say, you can be a national champion because you have the talent. He had taken 20th in the nation the year before. Well, in one year, he went from 20th to the national champion in high school. One year because of a vision map and staying to that vision map. That's the importance. Mm. You can apply vision mapping to anything. Yeah. And I happen to apply it to my projects at work. I have a, a company called NUMI, N-E-U-M-I, if you want to look it up. And we're a biotech company, and we've developed uh, the biggest breakthrough in the application of what's called nanotechnology, which allows nutrients to become more bioavailable and utilized. Yeah. And we've done it in record time. And we, we did it because we had a vision map and everybody that was working with me signed on to that vision map. Uh, Proverbs 16, 16 says that we should pursue wisdom above knowledge and understanding. Right. We can all agree that those are three things we want, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Is, what, what's the critical difference between okay. those three? Understanding, I see how things work. Okay. okay. Knowledge is one step further. Okay, I see how they work. What are the principles underneath it that make it work? Okay, so let's take aerodynamics. Okay, we know a plane has wings. Why does it lift off the ground? How does the weight transfer on the ground? The, the fuselage is holding up the wings, right? Mm -hmm. But once it's airborne, as soon as those wheels are off the ground, now the wings are supporting the fuselage. There's a mm. big, huge weight transfer. How come the wings don't fall off? See, 
Well, we, we understand the law of aerodynamics, but now we get a knowledge of weight transfer and other things that go with it. So that's knowledge. Wisdom is how do I apply the knowledge to the specific things that I need to get done. So we want to break the sound barrier in a jet. We get a great pilot named Chuck Yeager. We put him in the cockpit. Uh, instead of a jet engine, we try almost a little rocket. A rocket engine? engine. Yeah. And uh, he goes ahead and he breaks the sound barrier, but it brought all those. So wisdom is the application. And Solomon was great at applying what he had articulated when he was young. He was horrible at it when he got older. His pride got in the way mm. and his whole house collapsed. And that's typical. I've known a lot of guys that start out with humility. They gain tremendous success and all humility is gone. And when humility is gone, God dedicates himself to bring down the proud. Do you want God to bring you down, mm. brother? Pride comes before the fall. Yeah, but he also says he, tear, he destroys the house of the proud. Mm. See, you treasure your family above anything else, don't you? Yeah. Okay, so you want to protect that family, right? Right. So you want to stay humble. And that's why it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you. Let him exalt you. You don't need to exalt yourself. You talk about Solomon giving advice on the factors that can wreck a business and mm. wreck a relationship. Uh, what, what are those? I think we spoke about pride. Yeah. Is there more? Oh yeah, communication techniques. Uh, uh, for example, a soft answer turned away wrath, mm. but wrath, uh, uh, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Mm. And what do we do? I've done that a few times. Yeah, no, it escalates <laughs> until the argument's not even about the argument. Men can compartmentalize. We have a bad argument with our spouse. We put it in the back of our mind, but our spouse, a woman, if I poured Coca-Cola into this glass of water, it would turn brown. Guess what? You can't get the brown out. Yeah. It becomes one with the water. That's the spirit of a woman. So with our words, we can either lift people up, says the power of the tongue is life and death. We can bring death to a relationship just with our words. Yeah. I think this is interesting. You, you talk about the single biggest cause of financial loss yes. in businesses. Yes. What's that? Greed. Greed. We all Proverbs have seeds of greed. a lot greed. about greed. Yeah, yeah. We all have seeds of greed. Anybody that doesn't think they have seeds of greed, they, they don't know their heart. The reason I wear a black shirt when I minister, this is the human heart without Christ. Nothing can turn this white. You, I could offer a billion dollars today to anybody that could turn this black shirt white. They can't do it. But in God's miraculous grace, he takes this black heart and turns it white. I, I just can't even imagine, you know, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God.